everyone. Welcome to First Christian Church Online. We're so glad that you're here today. My name is Jordan, and I would love to connect with you. I um, want to encourage you today, as you're watching the service, to take a moment and reply to a chat. Say hey to somebody in there. Um, we'd love to connect with you. Um, also, you can always hop on over to scottsburg.church. That's our website. And on there, there's an online connect card. Uh, and I personally would love to connect with you this week if you fill that out and let us know how we can walk with you. Um, like I said, great things today. It's going to be a great service. Thanks for being back with us. We're glad that you're here. Let's take a few moments here and worship God.
Thanks for being with us here at First Christian Church Online. We just want to pause and just take a moment of remembrance as you may have watched that video or maybe even listened to it um, on the radio. Today is Memorial Day weekend and, and we just pause to remember the service, the sacrifice of all who help us live a free life. And as Christians, we know that Jesus ultimately is the one who served us best, who loved us most. And so we pray for all of our men and women who serve in the armed forces. We pray for our first responders, our, our police officers, our firefighters, our doctors, our nurses. And we pray that they, they stay safe because today we remember those who have given it all. God bless all of you. Thanks for being here with us. Let me pray. God, as we continue to talk about how we are to serve you, we recognize those who have served and have given their very lives. We especially remember Jesus Christ, who came to serve us and lead us to save us. So today, Father, as we talk about unleashing our spiritual gifts, we always just want to remember all that you've done, all that you continue to do. And Father, you have given us a plan. You have given us a purpose. So help us to unleash that upon this world so that we can help people find their way back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being here. Um, there was a study done by Maria Stinvinkel. She was a Sweden consultant, Swedish consultant for a company. She, was, she asked 65 people from around the world, what's your greatest fear in life? Well, as you might expect, people mentioned the fear of dying alone, losing their job, but of these 65 people, 14, that's one in every five, expressed a different fear. They expressed living life without purpose or meaning. Is that you today? Maybe you've had that thought. Maybe you've had that fear. Maybe you do have that fear right now. Maybe, maybe you're saying, Matt, that's me. I don't know what my purpose is. I just go through every day and I just get through and I survive. I want you to listen to these folks in their own words. Anthony from New York said, my biggest fear is never taking a risk in an effort to find my true calling. Rebecca from Germany, my greatest fear is to go through life living small, and not realizing it's not too late to start over. Danielle from Sacramento said, my greatest fear would be missing out on my purpose here on earth. I know I have a purpose, and I'm just not serving it yet. Ralph from North Brunswick, he said, my greatest fear is regretting all that I didn't do as I lay in my hospital bed as an elderly man. Luciana from Portugal. She said, my greatest fear is to go through life without leaving a positive mark. The question that I ask myself, and maybe the question you need to ask yourself, why is this such a fear? I mean, really, why would these people fear not having purpose? It must mean that there's something inside of us that draws us to have purpose. It must mean that we were created to leave a mark, to make a difference, to do something outside bigger than ourselves. We were, we were created to do this. There's something in us that is driving us to make a lasting impact. Impact. People all the time talk about legacy. 
kind of life people will remember. I, I do funeral after funeral after funeral, and people talk about the person that's gone and, and what they've left behind, their legacy, their family, all, all of these things. And, and I've talked to enough people over the last 25 years of ministry to believe this fear is absolutely true. People fear not having a purpose in this life. They fear it because it's part of who God created us to be. There's a drive inside of us to live life to the fullest. And Jesus said, I've come to give you that. I've come to, to not take away like the enemy, but to give you life to the full. And here's what I tell people. When they ask, I don't have purpose, or when they say something about fearing, um, not leaving a legacy, or any such of these things over the last 25 years, this is what I tell most of them. What if I told you God is taking care of that? God has given you everything you need to make a difference and live your life on purpose. Would you believe that? And would you follow that? And here's where some just don't like my answer. It's too hard. Because the answer involves following Jesus. Not just saying Jesus is good or I believe in Jesus, but actually sacrificing and surrendering your life to Jesus. There's a huge difference here. You see, I I can say that I believe all day long, but until I move to that next level of surrender... I may never understand the fullness of what God has for me. You see, Romans chapter 12, Paul says, Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, I urge you, I beg you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice of the kind he will find acceptable. Paul is telling us, and he's telling the the church in Rome, he's telling the, the Romans, give your bodies, literally give everything that you have. Your mind, your heart, your spirit, your soul, everything. Love the Lord God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Everything. Give your bodies to God. He said this is the true way to worship him. It's not enough to just kind of halfway do it. It's not enough to just go through the motions. It's not enough to just think it. We actually have to do it. You know, we talked about that last week. We're not just sprinkling little bits and pieces of Christian goodness around. We're actually called to live this life that is in Christ. And when we live our life in Christ and when we follow him, we have nothing but good goodness. <laughs> Will we have trouble and pain and struggle? Yes. But our life will be lived in such a way that we're full and satisfied. Here's what I know what happens, and it leads into verse 2. Paul says, Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Here's what I know. When my life derails, when it goes sideways, it's because I'm not living, <laughs> I'm not living out my part. When frustration and guilt and shame and all these negative things creep into my life, it's it's because I'm not copying the patterns of Jesus. I'm copying the patterns of this world. And I'm allowing all of this negativity and all of these things of the world to creep in. And they're the ones that are transforming me. These thoughts of the world... They're the thoughts that are transforming me when I lay down at sleep tonight. Not God. So I've got to worship him. I've got to give my whole life to him, my body to him. And I can't copy the patterns of this world. You know what happens when I follow Jesus and I live my life for him and I understand there's a purpose for me there? 
then God shows up and I understand what his good and pleasing will is, his perfect will. I understand how to love him fully and how to love my neighbors myself. That's purpose. I can choose to do a lot of things in this life. And God allows me to make a lot of choices for myself. But God's plan, God's purpose, is for me to be his workmanship, his perfect creation, his ambassador. So that while I'm here in this world, loving God with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength, loving my neighbor as self, I'm able to point people back to Jesus so that none will, none will suffer and all will be saved. It's what God wants me to do, I think. <laughs> followers, are G- followers of Jesus are to give their bodies to God, their life, their very breath, their, their very essence. We're to submit to God so that he can transform us. Today is a new day. This moment is a new moment. And even though I may have messed up royally this morning, I go to God and I say, God, forgive me for that stupidity, for that mistake, for that whatever. God, help me to be more like Jesus. And I pick up from that point and I move forward so that in my transformation, I can live out God's purpose. It's because God wants me to live out my life with purpose that he transforms me that he rescues me, that he redeems me, that he gives me spiritual gifts. He gives me gifts so that I can accomplish what he has planned, so that I can be satisfied, so that I can be full of joy. And he's given each follower this same capacity to serve and to benefit the church and the community, to benefit the body of Christ. So I want to talk to you today about some spiritual gift stuff. How you can live your life on purpose. The first thing is Christ followers are usually uninformed about their gifts. When I talk to people about spiritual gifts, most don't have a clue what their gifts are. Not to point you out today, but do you do you know what your spiritual gifts are today? Are you actively using your spiritual gifts? Because you have them. God's given them to you. Are you being obedient in that? Then there are other people who think they have certain kind of spiritual gifts, but they really don't. That person that really thinks God's gifted them to to sing, (laughs) they can't sing. That person who thinks they have the gift of hospitality, but yet they're cranky and rude and... You understand, you know those people, they're uninformed. They don't understand their gift. And there are still others that believe that every believer gets every gift. And then there are other people that believe gifts are sign of spiritual maturity. And then there are other people who use spiritual gifts as, as tools to say that they're, they're better Christians. What I've found is that most Christ followers are uninformed about their gifts. So let's ask a, let's answer a couple of questions today. Why do we have spiritual gifts in the first place? Romans chapter 12 verse 6, in his grace God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7, a spiritual gift is given to each one of us so we can help each other. Our gifts are given, different gifts are given so that we can do things well and help each other. That's pretty clear. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 and following, it says, The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. And then jump down to verse 24. While the more honorable parts do not require this special care, God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. Now listen to this, verse 25. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. Our gifts are given to us to bring harmony and unity 
not division, not to cause trouble or strife. Spiritual gifts were given so that the church can come together, care for one another, show the unbelieving world that we love Jesus, and allow everybody to have a part. Some have bigger parts, some have smaller parts. Some have on stage parts, some have cleaning bathroom parts. Some have been in this room right now where nobody sees parts. Spiritual gifts are given to strengthen the church, to provide for its guidance, and to encourage the believers to go and make a difference in the world, to live their life on purpose. God wants you to succeed. He wants you to be satisfied. That's why he gives you spiritual gifts so that you can build each other up, care for one another, love one another, encourage one another. So now we need to answer the question, who gives these spiritual gifts? Where do they come from? Can we learn them? Can we buy them? (laughs) Can we transfer them? It says in Romans 12, 6, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Who gave them? God did. Who chose which gift to give to each person? God did. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, regarding your question about these special abilities, the Spirit gives us. There were some believers who had questions about their gifts. And so Paul says, don't, don't, for, don't forget this. You don't give gifts to each other. You, you don't, spiritual gifts, you, you don't give them to each other. The Spirit given you through God. And then he goes on to say, God works in different ways. Not everybody's going to have the same gift. But it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Just because your gift is different than somebody else's doesn't mean that God loves you any less. One gift doesn't make you more spiritual than another gift. One gift doesn't make you better off than someone else. Do I believe God has given me the gift to preach and teach? Yes. Because there's no way that I could do this on my own. There's no way I could stand in the fire and continue to preach the truth without God giving me the gift to do it. Am I the most hospitable person out there? No. Do I have the gift of hospitality? I don't know. But it doesn't mean because I don't have that gift that I'm not hospitable. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Christ followers are, they're uninformed. Christ followers are also insecure about their gifts at times. Paul tells the church, and he urges the church in Rome, he says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out. (laughs) With as much faith as God has given you, don't, don't be insecure, speak out. If your gift is serving others, then serve them well. Don't be afraid of your gift. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. Write those letters. Make those phone calls. Visit those people down the street. If it's giving, Paul says, give generously. Did you know that some people, some of you, have been given a special ability and gift to make money? You've got the golden touch. And God has blessed you and provided for you and put you in places to where you are financially good. And if that's you, then your time and your talents and your resources are to be used generously for God. Don't be insecure about it. Don't hold it over other people's head as... Look how much I'm giving and look how much you're not. If that's you, you've missed the point. 
If you're a leader and you have leadership ability, then take that responsibility seriously. Step up and lead. Quit setting in the background and giving excuses not to lead. If you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't be afraid of your gift. And don't use your gift as a weapon. Don't be insecure. Show up in a way that says, I'm honoring God with my gift. The same God who does the work in all of us is the same God who gives each of us a special gift. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another, and someone else, the Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, another one the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from God or not. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is said. It is one and only, it is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. And when he decides and gives you a gift, don't be insecure about it. Lead well, do well, put it out there. Christ followers, though, sometimes like to compare our gifts, don't we? Paul says the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. It's the one spirit. We've all been baptized into the body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some of us are slave or free, male or female. The body has many different parts. And Paul uses this body analogy, and I love it. He takes it even one step further. He says, if the foot says I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that make it any less part of the body? And he goes on and he talks about an ear and an eye. And just think about that for a moment. Every part of your body matters. Every part of your body has a purpose. Some are made for Specific things. Some are seen by all. Some are only seen in private. But Paul says, if the body were an eye, if the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? We can't all be the same thing, and God has not designed us all to be the same thing. We're not to compare our gifts to other people. We, we are to take pride in our own gifts. We should take pride in our gifts and be thankful that God has chosen us for that gift. Now, don't become prideful with your gift or arrogant about your gift, but take pride in it. Our bodies have many parts. There are many parts, but one body over and over. Paul says, listen, You've been chosen for a purpose. You have a plan. There is something God wants to do with you, and he has gifted you to do it. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you are a part of it. You want to know why this church is struggling? You want to know why our church is struggling? Let me be frank for just a moment. church is struggling because people are not using their gifts or people are keeping their gifts to a certain small part of the church God wants us to use it for the glory of the church and him not ourselves our, our, our gifts are meant to be used to glorify God and to help him in his mission Matthew Henry said, gifts are for the common good of the church. Spiritual gifts are bestowed that men may with them profit the church and promote Christianity. They're not given for show, but for service. They're not given to magnify those that have them, but to help build others up. You want to know why we're struggling? Because people aren't using their gifts. 
And some people are keeping their gifts to themselves or to their small group or to their little people. The church will only grow. The church will only become as healthy as God wants it to be when we all come together and do our part. We don't compare our gifts to other people. We don't say our gifts are better than other people. We each do our part. And when we each do our part, this is what Paul says. Are we all apostles? No. Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we have the ability to interpret unknown language? All of us, do we all have that? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. And then Paul says, let me show you the way of life that is best of all. Here's the deal. And, and you, can, um, you can go online and, and you can look at some of the gifts that are there. Um, we're going to have a special thing out there for you on our website. And you can take this, you can download this little test and you, you can kind of see where you're at and help you decide. If you have questions about your gifts and want to use your gifts and want to get involved, then, then reach out to one of us. We would love to help you use your gifts to find your shape. That's what this whole series is about, is to really help you find your shape. And the first S of shape is spiritual gifts. So we want to help you determine what your spiritual gift is. And maybe it changes. Maybe it's changed. I don't know. God gives them. God takes them away. But here's the bottom line. Gifts are only good if we love God and love our neighbor. Gifts are, are only good if we do that. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. Do you hear what Paul's saying? If I could move mountains and yet did not love my neighbor, it doesn't matter that I can move a mountain. It's only benefiting me. If I possessed all the knowledge of the world, but didn't love my neighbor, it would mean nothing. He says, if I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my own body, I could boast about it. I could say, hey, look what I've given to the poor. Look how generous I am. Look at all that I've done. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Gifts, spiritual gifts, God has given us because God has a purpose for us. He's gifted us all in certain ways because we each are part of his purpose. And what is his purpose? For all of us to love him with our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourself. To show the world that love is patient, it's kind. It's not jealous or boastful or rude or proud. Our purpose is to use our gifts and to show the world that love keeps no records of wrongs. It's forgiving. It does not rejoice about injustice, but love rejoices whenever the truth wins out. We're to use our spiritual gifts together as the body to show the world that love never gives up. Love never loses faith. And when things are hard and, 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 and we hurt and the world just kicks us in the gut, we're always hopeful. 
and we can endure through every circumstance. He says, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless. These things will become useless, but love will last forever. Knowledge is partial and it's incomplete. Even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture, he says. He said, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when, when I grew up, when I found Jesus, when I surrendered my life to Jesus, I put away childish things. He says, we see things imperfectly now. Like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But we will see everything perfect someday. He says, all that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then, when Jesus returns, I will know everything completely. And so, as you use your spiritual gifts in this world to complete God's purpose for you, don't ever forget Our gifts are used for God's glory. And no matter what your gift is, at the end of the day, the most important thing for you you to do as a Christ follower is to have faith in the midst of every circumstance, to not give up, to believe when it's hard to believe, to believe when it's hard to see, when the doctor says there's no more, there's nothing else to do, when your life is over, have faith. Have hope. Today is not the end. And we will have struggle and pain and suffering. But friends, I've come to give you life to the full. The greatest of all of these, these things, is love. No matter what your shape is, no matter what your spiritual gift is, God wants you to use it to build up his church and to bring him glory. But no matter what part of the body you are, always have faith. Never lose hope. And love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love people as yourself. And every single day, go be the church. And when you mess up, get back on the horse. Be informed. Take pride that God is using you for a purpose and go out and be the church. Be the masterpiece that God created you to be. Be the ambassador that God created you to be. Be the royal priest that God created you to be. Be Jesus to someone today. Use your gifts. Use them well. Thanks for being here with us. God bless you. And we will see you next time.